Now we will begin with our section 3.6, which consists of the proof of the convergence theorem in dimensional regularization. In the previous section, we have done a lot of work on setting up our integrals and setting up our uh, forest formula, which gives the basis of our proof. But now we actually carry it out. That means, in particular, we will do the integrations and see how this analytical structure that is claimed arises after these integrations. In order to understand how the proof should be done, um, in order to motivate the structure of it, we will start with an example. And for the third time, at least, we will look at our famous two-loop graph that we have considered already uh, in the first section of our lecture. It's the same two-loop example as you know. Uh, with a slight modification, so today I will look at the same graph, but let's do it concretely for QCD, quantum chromodynamics, and then we have this two-loop diagram, which is identical to the diagram that we always discussed, a two-loop diagram with a one-loop sub-diagram here in the self-energy, but now this should be concretely a quark line and these should all be gluons with a triple gluon interaction here. And we do it in four dimensions, but with Feynman rules for QCD. And that means that now we have non-trivial numerators. So this diagram also exemplifies how we treat the non-trivial numerators that arise in general. And so here we have a nice concrete example, which is actually, of course, useful. So the subgraph is taken as usual, and also the full graph as usual, so this uh, single gluon self-energy insertion is the subgraph H, and uh, the full graph is what we have here. And uh, let's do it in four dimensions, so D0 is equal to 4. Okay, so this is then a quark line. These are all gluons. And then we have particular numerators. So this is the specific thing about QCD. In QCD, the quark propagator has here in the numerator uh, p slash plus m, where p slash is the propagator momentum. So in the usual way of counting, this would be line 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is line 5. Therefore, the numerator has L5 slash plus m5. Okay. So this is one numerator, which is a polynomial of first degree homogeneous in the variables for line number five, momentum and mass. Then uh, these two, we work in Feynman gauge, let's say, then the gluon propagator has just the one in the numerator. And uh, these vertices here are triple gluon interactions, and uh, they are linear in all the associated momenta. So this vertex here is linear in the momentum L1, L2, L3. This is linear in the momenta L1, L2, L4. And uh, the product is a bilinear polynomial in these uh, momenta L1, L2, L3, L4, a bilinear polynomial. So let's write it here, so the numerator is a bilinear polynomial in L1, L2, L3, L4. Now, in the previous uh, chapter, I said at one point that we should express the vertex factors if they contain momenta such that in the end, uh, we express everything in terms of the internal momenta of the graph. So here, this is now a vertex, which is part of the graph H. So it's part of the small subgraph H. And therefore, we should try to express the vertex momenta in terms of the inner momenta of H, or external momenta of the vertex, but not in terms of these external line momenta. Okay, but that is easy because by momentum conservation in QCD, we know that this momentum can be written as the sum of those two momenta 
Therefore, we can eliminate the dependence of this momentum in terms of L1 and L2. And uh, likewise, this momentum, which is called L4 uh, in QCD, is given by the sum or difference of these two, L1, L2. So in the end, this can be written by momentum conservation before doing any loop integration as a bilinear polynomial in just L1 and L2, uh, which are momenta of the subgraph H, and which can be replaced by derivatives with respect to U variables for the subgraph H. That was a criterion from before, and here we can fulfill it. Then let us write down some data for the Feynman diagram. The first uh, data are, um, let's say, the omegas, the degrees of divergence. And uh, so first of all, because this is the new thing, let us uh, denote the numerators. So here R H is the numerator degree for the subgraph H. And this is two, because it's a bilinear polynomial. So and the omega for the subgraph H is then given by uh, the dimensionality is four, so four times the number of loops. So this is four um, minus two times the number of propagators. This is all four minus four gives zero, so four minus four plus the numerator degree two is equal to two. So it's a quadratically divergent gluon self energy. Then R for the full graph, including everything, not reduced but full, uh, is three because we have here a numerator of degree one and here of degree two. So overall this is three. And then the omega for the full graph is given by two times the number of loops, eight minus the number of lines times two. We have five lines, so minus 10, plus the numerator degree is three. So overall we get one. This is the degree of divergence of a quark self-energy. And uh, QCD, all quark self-energy diagrams have degree of divergence one. So this is an example of that. So and previously we also needed, or it appeared, um, the R for a reduced diagram, or previously it was called R of a diagram G bar, which is just the numerator degree involving the lines of this reduced diagram. And here we get rid of this and only look at the rest. And then we have here just degree one from this line here. Then we can also look at the momentum. So what are the subgraph aware momenta for this graph and also other variables? So we would choose QH as the subgraph aware momentum one of the two independent ones for H. Let's call it here, uh, this would be vertex one. Then let us take P1. Then subgraph aware variables Q sub G are the momenta for the reduced diagram. So for the rest, where this is contracted to a point, and then we can take, for example, these two momenta here and get rid of that uh, from momentum conservation. So the set of these would be P3 and P4, where this is three and this is the vertex four. Then we can also uh, have the masses MH. The set of the masses in the subgraph MH uh, or H is the set of masses M1, M2. In QCD, the gluon is massless, but in our renormalization treatment, we treat all lines as massive. So we have here for each line automatically a mass with the appropriate index M1 and 2. And this is the set of masses for the subgraph. And then we have the set of masses for the remainder. So for the reduced graph G over H, and this would then be M3, M4, M5. And uh, similarly for the U's, subgraph aware partitions of U, so U1, U2 for the subgraph and U3, U4, U5 
for the remaining graph. And then we have a set of variables by which we can describe our graph. Now let's go into the appropriate sector. So our W for the graph, let me just double check something. So we go to the appropriate sector and write down our W. So W for the full graph G has the usual form, Q transpose times T to the minus one times M tilde to the minus one times T to the minus one times Q minus K prime, just like in the previous section. And also for this graph explicitly, we did it uh, in three for three or for such a kind of uh, uh, set of graphs. The difference in um, our explicit treatment in the previous uh, section was that there we only had one t variable for the subgraph and the overall graph did not have an extra t. Now we have systematically a t for the full graph, tg, and th for the subgraph. So the difference to previously is that now our t to the minus one is this matrix th times tg instead of just t from before. And here in this uh, reordered fashion to compare with this section. So it's not the same as in the previous section that we did today, 3.5, but it is the same as what we did earlier in section 343, because now we are explicitly at the two loop level and we have just two graphs like we had here. So then we have this reordered form. And the difference is that previously here we had th, th to the minus one, and here we had just one. And now we have everywhere in, in uh, addition a factor tg for the full graph. Then m tilde is, uh, as before, given by m hat plus th times BHG, and this matrix has the identical structure to what we had before. This is independent of T's. It contains just uh, zeros and ones. And uh, here you might wonder whether we should have here a product TH times TG, but we don't, because what happens here is uh, that we get an effect from the relative scaling between these blocks and these blocks. And the relative scaling is just th like it was in our previous calculation. So like before, we have here only th, but this here has changed by additional tg factors. Okay, then k prime is uh, the masses, and uh, the masses are now given the mass uh, by two sets. The masses in the subgraph are multiplied with two factors of t. So let me write it explicitly. This is Tg square times Th square times uh, the sum over the lines in the subgraph. This is just one and two. And uh, this is then Mk square times beta k. And remember, I use two conventions here, namely the mass absorbs the I epsilon and beta um, is uniformly used even for the labeled lines, but for the labeled lines, beta is identical to one and isn't integrated over. That makes the notation simpler. And then we have plus Tg square times K, the lines in the reduced graph G bar, which is the remainder uh, when we remove the subgraph H, times Mk square times beta K. So, and then we see what we also proved in the general case, what we see it here explicitly, namely our wg is now a function, and let me call it function g. And what does this function depend on? It depends on the rescaled variables as we discussed in our proposition uh, c today. So, this product here, t to the minus one times q, it means that we obtain the following variables. We obtain qh, uh, tilde, which is the product of th, tg, qh. This appears in this combination. And qh alone 
never appears, it appears exclusively in this combination. Likewise, QG tilde defined as TG times QG without tilde. This momentum only appears in this combination via this product here. Never appears uh, in any other way. And uh, similarly, let me not write down all the definitions, but similarly also U appears, the U's also appear in the rescaled form, U tilde H, U tilde G, M tilde H, and M tilde G. They all appear in the obvious uh, definition, so U H tilde is uh, redefined with this inverse here, U tilde G is defined with this inverse, M tilde H is defined with that product, M tilde G is defined just with TG. It depends on these combinations. Does it depend on anything else? Yes, it depends on something else, namely it depends on the betas via uh, uh, this, and also of course the M depends on the betas. This uh, has a dependence on the betas, so uh, it depends on all the beta case via m hat and the masses. And it depends on th explicitly from here, from this innocent looking factor. This is the single dependence on th. th alone never appears anywhere else, only here. So it depends on this, does it depend on anything else? Well, maybe one could say with a semicolon, it depends of course on the dimensionality the, uh, no, it doesn't because it's just uh, W, not the uh, full integrand. So this really depends precisely on these variables. And how does it depend on them? Of course, it is a C infinity function in all these variables. Um, as we discussed, the M tilde is invertible. And not only that, its determinant is always bigger than a constant. Therefore, the inverse is continuous and doesn't blow up. It doesn't get a pole in the integration region. So it's infinitely differentiable in uh, these precise variables. Even at t equals zero, just to stress it. Now, I already made this remark, but uh, for this it is important that we use as a variable u tilde, because u alone uh, depends on t inverse. So originally the thing depends on t inverse and then for t equals zero we have a pole. For a fixed u, but t is zero, we have a pole. But as a function of u tilde, if this is treated as an independent variable, then t can go to zero uh, while u tilde is constant and we have no singularity whatsoever. So it's um, differentiable in both variables u tilde and t, even at t equals zero and also at u tilde equals zero. So, in, as I said, for this u tilde is important. Good. Let us uh, write down something for comparison, namely the WH part. The WH part. In our lemma and also today uh, earlier, we discussed going from WG, the full graph, to WH for the subgraph. And in the lemma, we needed to do it by applying a projection. Let us do the same projection here. WH is now defined as the projection Q transpose times T to the minus one times M hat instead of M tilde to the minus one times T to the minus one times the projection on the subspace for the subgraph H times Q minus K prime only for the subgraph H. So what is this? This is actually identical to what we had in section 343 up to uh, maybe some replacement. Is there a replacement? Yes, of course there is a replacement because everywhere there appears now the combination TH times TG instead of TH only like we had before. 
This single appearance of th doesn't matter for us since we are using m hat instead of m tilde. So everywhere uh, that t appeared before, it is now replaced by the combination th times tg. So it is as in that section with the replacement t over there, we only called it t without an index because we had just one t, t going to th times tg. And uh, we can also say what we said earlier on today, this is the same as if we would look at the graph H in isolation. Because then we only have one T variable for it and no TG at all. And uh, afterwards we do the replacement TH going to the product TH times TG. So this uh, projected WH uh, is not the same as the one we would obtain in isolation, but up to this replacement. Now let us look at the numerator briefly. The numerator is new compared to our previous uh, studies where we looked at this example. Uh, let me use the um, same notation as we used in our proposition before. Set G is the full numerator multiplying uh, all vertices and all lines. This is now given as a product of, okay, I have a double notation problem here because CG was on the one hand the uh, full uh, product of all numerators, but on the other hand, we wanted to split it into a product of the subgraph and the reduced graph, so let me now do it in a more explicit way than before. This is uh, this times that, and uh, this set G over H is now just coming from the quark line, so explicitly it is given by minus I gamma mu times D uh, with respect to U5 mu plus M5. Okay, this is the precise expression for our uh, quark um, propagator numerator. It reproduces L slash plus M for line number five. And uh, so this is this derivative. And on the other hand, set H, uh, I don't want to write it down exactly by using QCD Feynman rules because the only thing we need to know is that it's a polynomial of second degree homogeneous, so it only contains second degree terms in d by d u1, um, or let's say u h. Uh, it doesn't contain masses and it doesn't contain the q's as external momenta. So the product cg is then given as follows. So we can rescale it like we did in our proposition. So from here, we can replace these variables by tilde variables, which appear in our WG. So let's do it. So let's replace this by TG to the minus one times the tilde variables. Then it is correct. Let me write this directly as simply Z tilde G over H, which is defined to be that with the replacement u by u tilde and m by m tilde times this set h. Here it's a second degree polynomial and if we transform this into tilde variables, then we get z tilde h and uh, the tilde variables involve the factor tg times th and they appear square because it's a homogeneous second degree polynomial. So we get this product to the power minus two. So, and uh, just to, oh, sorry. All of the z tilde now depend only on d by d u tilde five and d by d u h tilde and uh, nothing else but here also m tilde five. This is what they depend on. And the expressions are identical to those ones here. So now let me write down explicitly the following note on the use, which is important for us. 
Uh, I already alluded to it uh, several times, but let me write down a formula for it. Let's say we have d by du of such a structure function of the ratio u over t. Then it seems like we have a problem because, uh, and that is the original uh, thing that appears because we have exactly this combination, u over t from the multiplication over there, and we are um, forced to take derivatives with respect to u. Therefore, this appears. And this derivative now generates from the inner derivative some extra factors of 1 over t, which are singular at t equals 0, but we integrate over t down to 0, and we might have to take t equals 0 in some places of the calculation. So this is uh, making our life difficult. What we need to remember is that also we need to put u to 0 at the end of, uh, or after taking the derivative, u is put to 0. So and actually the order in our calculation is this. We first take a derivative with respect to u, then we put u to 0. And only then we integrate over the loop momentum, or in other words, over the alphas and t's and betas. So u is put to 0 always before doing uh, the loop integrations. That is important, and this is true by definition because we use this derivative only to extract the numerator, and afterwards we forget about uh, the u variables. But nevertheless, in this form, um, it uh, is difficult to use and treat uh, in, in our integrations because it generates this additional singularity. Now let's look at this, what happens if we replace uh, this by u tilde. So let's say u tilde is equal to u over t. Then we have here f of u tilde. And then the derivative in complete generality can be written as t times derivative with respect to u tilde. That is an identity. Now, uh, sorry, um, 1 over t of course. 1 over t times d by du tilde is the same as d by du using inner derivative. So that is the same. Now, if we do that, then this object alone generates no additional 1 over t singularity. In this case, it doesn't depend on t at all, but even in general, this derivative is harmless from the point of view of 1 over t. This does not contain any 1 over t. And now if we take u tilde to 0, you might wonder whether it is correct to take u tilde to 0 instead of u or u over t. So the order matters. So since we must take u to 0 before doing the t integration, this is really the same as uh, replacing u over t by u tilde, taking this derivative, then setting u tilde to 0, and afterwards dividing by t. So this is an identity, and here in this form, the derivatives and the u appearance um, is harmless because the, um, the function and even its derivatives um, are not singular in terms of t, but whatever singularities might come from this derivative are factored out explicitly here, and they can be treated with our formalism uh, nicely, and actually we have treated these explicit 1 over t singularities by going to the z tilde variables and the uh, derivative operators in our proposition c. This is uh, the reason for doing it. So, u tilde um, leads u tilde equals 0 leads to the same result. Um, but exhibits explicitly the 1 over t singularities. Now let me explain to you the plan that we want to do with the example. Our plan is to treat completely this uh, 
renormalization, 1 minus t gamma times 1 minus t h applied onto g. Step by step, take the graph g, then apply this operation onto it. That should subtract the subdivergence corresponding to the subgraph. Then we apply this and uh, obtain a hopefully finite result. And what we should see and, uh, is, first of all, if once we apply this, we need to insert a counter term corresponding to the subgraph H, and its divergence should be local. Then we do the subtraction, and then we are able to extract the remaining divergence here, and that remaining divergences should also be local. We know that they are local already from the previous calculation of this example. But now we do it exactly using this setup of the forest formula, and we use exactly the same steps as the ones we can use in the general proof. Why did we not do it before? We looked at this example already at least twice. The first time we looked at this uh, two-loop graph, first of all without numerators, but the first time we looked at it was in our section one on introductory examples, and there we had the purpose of calculating as quickly as possible with any means that uh, is available uh, a two-loop graph in order to see what is the divergence structure, and then we uh, encountered the non-local divergences uh, as long as we have not subtracted the subdivergences. So that was the first thing, and we did it explicitly by using gamma functions and beta functions and so on, because that just works for this Feynman graph, but it doesn't work in general. Then we looked at the graph a second time uh, after introducing uh, alpha formalism, and we uh, used it to um, do the counterterm subtraction using alphas, and already at that time uh, we discovered that not only the alpha formalism is necessary and useful, but also we needed to go to these u variables in order to treat momenta in numerators, and we uh, discovered this operation of inserting a subgraph into a full graph, and so essentially the second time I did the example with you was for you to see the necessity and the usefulness of the u variables and also um, uh, this operation of inserting counter terms. And now we do it a third time by directly applying the fully general formalism, which will always work, and uh, doing exactly the same uh, sequence of steps. So this is the plan. And uh, so the first step would be this. 1 minus th on the graph. That generates two graphs, namely the original two-loop graph, 1 times g, plus the counter-term graph, which we obtain by contracting h to a point and replacing h by its uh, divergence. And so this is then evaluated as minus t times the divergence, uh, or minus the divergence of the gluon self-energy evaluated in isolation and then inserted into this diagram here. So, and what we need to uh, do is to evaluate it in this form and then precisely look at the structure of the result. Actually, a structure of the calculation and the structure of the result. And then we will get some intuition of how these intermediate results look like in general. And uh, that intuition can be used as a starting point for an induction, which can then be completed. So then, as the next step, we apply 1 minus Tg onto the result. And that, uh, of course, gives us the same two graphs plus the associated counter terms or minus the divergent part of them. And what we in particular need to uh, pay attention to is to the question, is this remaining divergent part local or not? We will see that it is. And we will need to figure out how to see it and how to see it in general. Right, so let's go on. This is our plan, and uh, now let's start doing it. 
we begin uh, by setting up our full graph tree in the usual way we can uh, set up the integral of it uh, like this let me directly write down the result so this two loop integration in the appropriate sector of course uh, is a loop factor cd square times two square for each loop and then integral over betas. Let me divide the beta integral into betas for the outer loop, three and four. Let's say five is the labeled line for the outer graph. Then an integral over Tg for the outer graph, Tg to the appropriate power, which is uh, minus omega g, degree of divergence, minus one, and then plus four epsilon. Where did the four epsilon come from? Because in the exponent we had L loop number times D. That gets replaced by a power counting degree where there is D zero. So we have overcounted two epsilon times the number of loops. We have two loops, therefore plus four epsilon in the exponent, which is important. Uh, this is the basis of dimensional regularization. Then we have also uh, the other T integral, dt for the subgraph, dth, to the power minus omega h, minus one plus two epsilon, uh, because it's one loop, we only get two epsilon. Then times, um, let us divide the numerator into the product z tilde g over h, uh, and then I can do z h tilde, and I can at some point write the integral beta 1. Let's say beta 2 is the label line for the subgraph, then we have a beta 1 integral, and what remains is dg to the minus d over 2 times e to the i w g. And uh, this contains derivatives with respect to the u variables. So we can set the u variables to zero at the end and uh, we set the u tilde variables to z before doing the uh, t integrations. And so let's do it like this. We set u h to zero and then we can bracket it somehow such that the t integrations are done. So we first set u h tilde to zero. Afterwards we do the t h integration and then at some point we set the u g tilde to zero much later and then we do the tg integration. Okay, and uh, so this is, uh, I guess, obvious. Let me bracket it a little bit more in detail. So if we start a bracket here and end the bracket here, then you see here, uh, here an object which uh, still depends on the variable th for the subgraph, but otherwise it contains uh, the subgraph derivatives with respect to u tilde from the subgraph and the subgraph beta integration. And here we have the basic integrand of our full graph, the semantic polynomial and e to the iw for the full graph. Now, this is something where we have a statement on from our uh, previous proposition. Namely, this is a C infinity function of all variables. And what are the variables? Uh, the variables are the tilde variables and all the t's and all the betas. And uh, so it's C infinity in all these variables. And uh, it is understood that we always take the tilde variables and it remains C infinity even if we integrate over beta and it remains C infinity if we take derivatives because if it's C infinity and we take derivatives, it's still C infinity by definition. And of course it also remains C infinity in all the remaining variables if we set the subgraph u tilde to zero. We shouldn't yet set the u tilde g to zero because this has an interference with the outer graph. But uh, we can set this to zero 
and evaluate the beta 1 integral and then we obtain here whatever, we obtain something, we might even give it a name, let's give it a name, so this object, the blue bracket including setting uh tilde to 0, this is a function, let's call it g. Uh, previously we also had a function g but let's forget about the previous one. This is now the function g and it depends on all the tilde variables q tilde h, also q tilde g, uh, m tilde h, m tilde g um, and it contains the u tilde g but not u tilde h because that is set to zero and it contains all the t's. It does not contain tg because uh, this function was from the beginning independent of tg. Uh, excuse me, sorry, uh, that's wrong. It does contain tg because it uh, is contained here in the exponent, but otherwise it doesn't. Um, and it contains the remaining beta 3 and 4 variables. And it contains the dimensionality d and it is um, C infinity in all these variables. So this is good to know and this is our integral setup. Then we also need to set up uh, for our first calculational step in the upper right diagram there appears the counter term for the gluon self energy at one loop. So this is also something we need to calculate very early on. Set up of H in isolation. So this graph just in isolation is given by one loop factor times one power of two times the integral over um, dth th to the minus omega h minus 1 plus 2 epsilon, exactly as over there, times a beta integral, integral beta 1, times uh, z tilde h and d tilde h to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i w h in isolation. And then u tilde h put to zero. Okay, so uh, here there appears the d tilde for the subgraph and uh, w for the subgraph in isolation. So only this depends on this isolation um, uh, denotion because that means that here there is no tg. While here there is a tg. Here there is no and here there is anyway no t variable at, at all in this um, d tilde h from the beginning and um, therefore it contains no tg. This numerator for the gluon self energy in isolation is exactly the same as the numerator uh, when it's inserted into the full graph. Therefore this is precisely the same object expressed in terms of derivatives with respect to the u variables. Therefore I can use the same symbol. So and of course uh, this expression therefore is also C infinity in all these variables. Let me not write it down but it is a fact and it remains C infinity after setting u tilde h to zero and even after integrating over beta one. So this is our setup. Now let us start the actual evaluation. The actual evaluation can be done in any order. We need to evaluate both the two-loop diagram and the one-loop counter-term diagram. Uh, and let us start with the simplest, uh, as we did also earlier. Let us start with a one-loop insertion. So we need this, and from it we need the divergent part. So let's do it. H isolated. And we only need the divergent part in our calculation and the divergent one over epsilon pole can only come from the t integration at the limit t equals zero. Therefore, we need to evaluate this. 
This might give more than a 1 over epsilon pole, and uh, this T operation then really extracts the 1 over epsilon pole. Uh, so this is more than we need. But anyway, uh, all we need comes from here. So let's evaluate it. This is equal to, let's directly jump to the result, because we know what we have to do. This T integration gives a 1 over epsilon from uh, this a distribution interpretation of the integral, and we had an explicit formula which gives here in this case 1 over 2 epsilon from here times the derivative with respect to th with a degree omega h of the remainder at t equals 0. But the remainder also contains the uh, selection uh tilde equals zero first. Uh, but anyway, and then we put here everything in between. So that is cd times 2 times uh, z tilde h integral over beta 1 d tilde h to the minus d over 2 times e to the i wh in isolation. All right. That is what we need to compute. But before we compute it, let's give it a name. This is 1 over 2 epsilon times a big expression. What is this big expression? Let's call it p superscript epsilon. So it anyway it depends on epsilon, of course. Or maybe not, of course, but it depends on epsilon because there is a d here and a d here, and we have not set d to uh, 4 or to the physical dimension. So this is still depending on epsilon, and it remains depending on epsilon even after setting everything to 0. So it depends on epsilon. It is an object which is specific to the graph h, so we call it p sub h. And what does it depend on? What are the variables it depends on? It does not depend on beta because this is integrated over. It does not depend on th because that is integrated over or set to zero. It uh, only depends on physical parameters of the Feynman diagram, which are our variables. Um, so we didn't write it down, but it depends on q tilde h and m tilde h and at first at u tilde h, but then u tilde is set to zero. t doesn't exist anymore, therefore this thing doesn't depend on the tilde variables because the tilde variables are rescaled with t. This object, after doing this operation, it depends on the real full qh without tilde, and it also depends on the full mh without tilde, and it precisely depends on these two and on nothing else. There is no t, no beta anymore. This is just a function of two physical parameters with nothing else. What is this function? Let me just, there is no q tilde anymore, or m tilde. What is this function? I claim this is a polynomial. That's why I call it p. Why is this a polynomial? Let's first write it down. This is a polynomial. in the arguments qh and mh of degree omega h. So it's a very special polynomial. It's actually a homogeneous polynomial. It contains precisely only terms of this degree in these two variables. How can we see that? This is very important for us since we know we want to prove locality of counterterms so if something complicated turns out to be a polynomial, this is surely important. So what is the reason for this? The reason is the following. So we have actually here the following uh, kind of object. We have some derivative or many derivatives with respect to a variable. And now I give it a name. Let's call it g sub h. And this function g sub h depends really on what? It depends 
on uh, before doing the t uh, setting to zero or t integration. This still depends on the tilde variables. And really, it precisely only depends on tilde variables. So at this point, the square bracket depends only on q tilde h, which is th times qh. And it depends on m tilde h, which is th times mh. And it depends on nothing else. It doesn't depend individually on t. It doesn't depend individually on q or m. It only depends on these precise two combinations after setting u tilde h to 0. So this is what we have. And now what? And moreover, at the end of taking the derivative, we set th to 0. What happens in such an expression? So it depends on t, but only via combinations. So that means we can rewrite the derivative, uh, if we want to make it completely explicit, uh, using the chain rule. So this derivative is like taking the derivative with respect to q tilde, and then we multiply with the inner derivative, which is q. So it's like q times d by d q tilde plus m uh, d by d m tilde. So this is the structure. This is the structure. So that means every t derivative actually acts like a derivative with respect to the tilde variables and afterwards multiplication with q or m. That means if we act with uh, omega times derivatives onto this, then we extract automatically prefactors which are omega powers of q's and m's. So we get omega powers of q's of m's or m's at pre as prefactor, so the prefactor becomes automatically a homogeneous polynomial of this degree in these two variables. But what is the remainder? The remainder is some derivative of a function with respect to tilde variables, but at the end of the day, we set th to zero. That means at the end of the day, the t tilde variables are zero. That means we get a polynomial in these uh, variables q and m times some function which has zero arguments. So a function with zero arguments is a number. It is a constant. It does not depend on q or m and not on t because t is zero. That means uh, this is equal and therefore this is a polynomial. as claimed in, in automatically this degree. So let's uh, frame this because this is a general kind of argument which will uh, repeatedly occur and it always goes in this way. So if we have a function which only depends on tilde quantities, we take a derivative with respect to t, afterwards set t to zero, then we always get a polynomial. So here we have encountered this for the first time, and this is an important take-home message from the example. So our divergent part of the isolated H gives us such a polynomial, but we are not yet at the end of the calculation. We have only started, actually. And uh, uh, this is just the divergent part coming from the T integration, and now we can extract from this actually the divergence which need to be put into a counter term, which would be the 1 over epsilon pole. And the 1 over epsilon pole of this is now obtained by setting epsilon to 0 here, extremely simply, and keeping the 1 over 2 epsilon at the front. That's just then the 1 over epsilon pole. That would be our T of this um, diagram. But anyway, the more general result is this. So uh, we know something else which I want to write down. We have found this polynomial in the momentum and mass variables, which still depends on epsilon. And of course, the coefficients in the polynomial are therefore depending on epsilon. Uh, the epsilon dependence is in the coefficients. And what is this epsilon dependence? Uh, all the time before, we always had an analytic dependence in epsilon. So uh, everything, uh, the epsilon only came from the exponent, something to the power of epsilon. This is just an exponential function, which is totally 
analytic or holomorphic in epsilon, and uh, that remains the case because it's never changed, and so the coefficients are analytic in epsilon. Very good, and that means, as I said before, T of H in this general notation, which is now T of our subgraph for the gluon self-energy evaluated in isolation, is given by 1 over 2 epsilon times this polynomial P at 0, H of the two variables QH and MH. So we have found our result. And uh, of course, if we say nothing else, then this is of course evaluated in isolation because how else could we evaluate it? So if we don't say something else. So by the way, this evaluation in isolation is quite important because this is then interpreted um, as a counter term in the Lagrangian. A counter term in the Lagrangian for some graph must not depend on which graph you insert it into. So if this is inserted into a bigger graph G or into an even bigger graph G prime, uh, this counter term in the Lagrangian is unambiguous. It's whatever it is, fixed once and for all. So this can only be evaluated in isolation. And if this gives rise to a contradiction, then we are doomed. So we must evaluate the counter terms in isolation. We have done it. Now let's go on. The next step in our plan would be to evaluate uh, the insertion of this into the reduced graph G over H. So this is this operation here, corresponding to the counter term graph. Let me write down the result. So this is a one loop uh, graph, therefore one loop factor times two uh, times the integration dt g t g to the following exponent. And at first, let's write down explicitly because uh, this is a bit more difficult to see that the uh, omega appears. This is the number of lines in the reduced graph, i g over h, minus d times the loop number of g over h, minus one. So this is always true. And then we have to see whether we also get this r, the numerator degree in this formula. At the moment, we don't have it yet. So we get t to the minus one times z tilde g. This corresponds to the numerator derivatives. And then we insert uh of this divergence. Okay. This is the precise uh, insertion. Let, let me first go on before explaining it. d tilde g over h to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i w g over h. And again, afterwards, we set u tilde g to zero. Okay, so what uh, do we have here? Now well, first, u g to zero. So what do we have here? So first, we have the usual uh, loop treatment for the one loop graph, g over h with an insertion. So uh, at first, we do not have rescaled variables. And at first, we only have this from the measure transformation and from the semantic polynomial transformation. So this is all standard and known to us for quite a long time. Now the new thing is the numerator. The numerator is at first zg without tilde. It has derivatives with respect to the line ug. Uh, concretely, it contains a derivative with respect to u5, because our line number 5 is the quark propagator. But then we have already seen that this can be transformed into z tilde, which contains a u tilde derivative. Uh, with the appropriate power of t. So we have done this. But here we have uh, the new thing, which is the insertion of the counter term. Now, the counter term is the divergent part of the one loop diagram. So it is, let's imagine, uh, it is um, polynomial of second degree. Actually, in QCD, we know that it does not depend on the mass. So what it really is, is a second degree polynomial in the momentum. So it's q mu, q nu, or something like this. 
So this must be inserted into the two loop graph and that means this operation tells us that the Q here is replaced by derivatives with respect to U multiplied with this reduced incidence matrix that we called BHG. So that was this replacement U going to uh, Q, uh, sorry, minus I BHG times D by DUG. So that was this replacement, this is this operation. And uh, so it replaces those Qs coming from the divergent part by such derivatives. Okay, and that is inserted here. So that means this expression is a derivative operator with derivatives ug, but not ug tilde. Now we can also transform this, of course, in the same way. So it's a polynomial second degree in the use. Let me simply draw it like this, d by dug square in quotation marks as a second degree polynomial. So and that can then be replaced by Tg to the appropriate power and derivatives with respect to u tilde g square. And so what we need to factor out is Tg square in order to make it correct. Okay, and so we can rewrite this as a derivative operator where this is replaced by ug tilde. And that means we get an additional factor of Tg uh, to the minus two. Uh, y minus two um, u g is ah so this is equal to t g times that and therefore we need t g to the minus two here right and therefore um, in order to have a nice notation. Let's write this as equal to Tg to the minus two times uh tilde of T of h, where the definition of uh tilde is that we do the same replacement as here and afterwards replace the u's by u tildes and all the other variables by tilde variables. And we might need such a notation also later. UG is defined as UH with a replacement uh, D by the UG um, QH MH replaced by D by the UG tilde. QH double tilde MH double tilde, which are all equal to, as we used here, Tg times D by D U. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry, I was confused for a moment. QH, MH. Right, so why yet another notation? We have seen that we want to bring this uh to the form uh tilde with derivatives with respect to ug tilde. And for that we needed to multiply with tg square. Now in general, uh, this expression here does not only contain derivatives with respect to u, but it might contain also masses or other momenta q's. And then all the variables here are coming from the inner subgraph h. Now if we want to define it like this, then all the variables, not only the u derivatives, but also these q's and the m's have to be rescaled with a uniform factor tg. That means that rescaling here is not the one that we used originally, but it's a different one. qh is now rescaled only by tg. Previously it was rescaled by tg times th. Now it's only rescaled by this and therefore I use this double notation. And this is a first indication of what I mentioned before, namely uh, if we start doing step by step the renormalization of subgraphs, then we need different rescalings. Each time we treat a new subgraph, our optimal rescaling changes. 
And here, this is the first incidence where we need a second rescaling. Namely, the edges are only uh, rescaled by, G, by the bigger graph and not by the subgraph variables. Okay, so this naturally appears here. So we use this notation. Capital U tilde is defined as the normal U with the replacement corresponding to the outer graph, not to the full graph, but only to the outer graph. So to give it a name, this is a different rescaling. And it is appropriate or optimal for treating G over H. Okay, good. That was a long explanation for this step. But anyway, now we can just summarize it. And uh, if we summarize it, then we have here Tg to the minus 1, another Tg to the minus 2. And combining it with this, we see that Tg appears to the power omega, namely the degree of divergence, as it usually does. So we get Cd times 2 times the T integral, d Tg. Tg to the power minus omega g, which is the degree of divergence of the full graph, not of the reduced graph, but of the full graph, because it comes from the degree of divergence of the lines in the um, reduced graph, but then also the degree of divergence of the subgraph enters via this insertion here. This is the degree of divergence of the subgraph. And it combines with this outer degree of divergence to give us the degree of divergence of the full graph, omega g, minus 1. And then we have plus 2 epsilon, but not 4 epsilon, because the 2 epsilon comes from the fact that we have here a one-loop diagram. And uh, in the two-loop diagram, we would have here 4 epsilon, but we have 2 epsilon. Then what remains is this z tilde g and u tilde h with the argument p of h and the remaining factors copied from here d g over h tilde to the minus t over 2 times e to the i w g over h at now u tilde uh, g equals 0. Very good. Now we can try to put it here in this small place. But I think this can just work. And then we evaluate now 1 minus t sub h acting on the full graph g. Now we have, uh, we have actually not really calculated the full graph g. Only over there we have the setup. We didn't do any calculation. We only discussed what its analytical structure is before doing uh, non-trivial integrations. Then we have discussed the divergence of H alone, it's here, and uh, the insertion into this. So this is, of course, explicitly it's G minus um, G over H with the insertion of TH. So this is uh, written over there, and uh, that is what we have just done here, and this is the result. So let's combine it. This is equal to the following. And uh, I will copy it from here because I want to highlight the particular structure. So I factor out one loop factor, CD times 2, which appears here. And uh, there it appears squared. But I factor it out only once. Then I factor out the TG integration. DTG, TG to the minus omega G minus 1 plus 2 epsilon, OK? So here we have exactly this exponent. Over there we have another exponent. There we have plus 4 epsilon. So this needs to be taken into account later. But this is what we factor out first. Then we have everywhere an integral over betas, beta 3 and 4. And by the way, did I forget to write it here? Because here we also must have it, an integral over betas. So let me write it here, integral beta 3 and 4. And also here, we have the integral over beta 3 and 4. And what is actually depending on beta? Uh, this is the only place where the beta dependence enters. 
So we can write it here. And uh, then we have z tilde g over h. This appears, uh, by the way, why did I call it z g? This is z tilde g over h, z tilde g over h. Sorry for that. And uh, this is the identical numerator as it appears in our full Feynman graph, which contains the quark um, line prop, uh, numerator L slash plus M. And uh, so we called it like this before, and so let's also call it like this here and uh, also here. So this appears as a prefactor. It's a derivative operator, but it appears as a prefactor. And then all of this is multiplied or acts on a big bracket. And let's first copy into the bracket the thing we have from over there. So let's, what are the additional factors we have there? The first factor is this Tg to the additional power of 2 epsilon that reproduces the Tg coefficient that we have over there. Then, from over there, we have an additional loop factor, Cd times 2, because it appears squared over there. Then, we have our integral over T, dTh times Th to the power minus omega h minus 1 plus 2 epsilon. And then what remains is hopefully everything that we called our function g. Everything what remains is our function g. Let's not uh, write down the arguments, but this function summarizes z tilde h, the integral over beta 1 of the, uh, yeah, of the g to the exponent and so on. And then we should set u tilde h did we set already uh, u tilde h is already set to zero in this function g by definition. So uh, we don't need to do anything here. So that is the full expression for our two loop graph g. Now comes the full expression with a minus for this and uh, we just need to copy it. What happens? So we have already the loop factor cd times two the integration over Tg with the appropriate exponent. Then we have the integral over beta 3 and 4. We have the z tilde g over h. So what remains here in the bracket is u tilde h of t of h times d tilde g over h to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i w g over h. Then we close the bracket, and only at the end we can set u tilde g to zero. That means we have identified a curly bracket, which is the interesting part. This is what corresponds to the cancellation of the subdivergence. So I've written it specifically in a way. Let's give it a frame. Specifically written it in a way which has in the first line the outer loop expression, namely the outer loop factor, which always appears with any loop, the t integration corresponding to the outer loop, the beta integration corresponding to the outer loop, and also the numerators coming from the outer loop. And then in the bracket, we combined whatever can be combined. Namely, here, this is the first line coming from the remaining let's say, sub-integration of the actual two-loop diagram. And this is the result from the counter-term diagram. Okay? This is the precise expression. And now, this needs to be evaluated. And our question that we raised in the beginning, how do we see the cancellation of the subdivergence? And what is the analytical structure of the result after cancellation of the subdivergence? And once we have understood the analytical structure of this, then we can go on to the next level and treat the outer loop and also study the divergences of the outer loop. And if we do it in high enough generality, then we get a good idea of what can be done for an arbitrary multi-loop diagram. Okay, so after cleaning the blackboard, I have added some information from what we had before. So we wrote here 1 minus th acting on g. The upper line is 
the outer loop integration and the curly bracket is the inner loop integration after combining the counter term graph and the full graph. Now here the uh, abbreviation G stands for this expression which is the inner loop essentially with beta 1 integration and uh, ZH tilde variables and this um, divergence of the subgraph H uh, led to this definition of the polynomial P epsilon of H, an epsilon dependent polynomial of second degree in the momenta and masses in general of the subgraph H. And that was defined by the derivative with respect to TH of this one loop expression also containing Z tilde H and beta 1 integral and uh, subgraph D tilde and E to the IW factors. Here we have the full D tilde and E to the IW for the full graph. Okay, so these are definitions which appear here. And now we can combine the curly bracket, which means that we uh, manipulate uh, the parts of our expression which correspond to the subgraph and try to extract um, the finite result after the subgraph divergences have hopefully cancelled. So, how do we do it? Let's do it here. What we need to do in order to combine the first and second line of the curly bracket is, of course, um, we need to evaluate the TH integration. The TH integration is now what remains to be done in the full graph. We have already done it in the subgraph. Here we need to do it, and then we need to compare the uh, expressions. So, and the T integration of the full graph has two elements. It is divergent, possibly. We know it is. It can be divergent in general. And uh, its divergence is extracted by again taking the t derivative at t equals zero, and then there will also be a finite remainder. And of course, we are after a full calculation, so we keep the finite remainder, but it's finite, and the divergence can be discussed by taking only the divergent part of this. So the idea is that the divergent part will be combined with the divergent part from here. That might add up to zero or to something finite. And then we have this finite remainder plus uh, the non-divergent part of the TH integral. And then with all of this, we then go on to the second loop. So let's do this. And uh, the first thing is we take only the first line and only the TH divergent part. And uh, once we did that, we combine it to the other divergence. Okay. So what is this? Um, we directly uh, can write down, namely, uh, the T integration gives as a divergence 1 over 2 epsilon from the exponent and then the T derivative of, okay, this Tg to the power 2 epsilon, which appears uh, has nothing to do with the inner loop. It comes from the outer loop. But anyway, we have it, and so let's write it down, and then we obtain really the T derivative, D by DTH to the power omega h of the rest. And the rest is now the loop factor, cd times 2, and uh, what we called g here. Okay. At t equals 0. That is the divergent part. And now, you know we want to combine it with a counter term. And uh, so this is a derivative of an expression, a semantic expression, d tilde g and e to the w g, and we take a t derivative. Well, that is our lemma and also our proposition d that we uh, established an hour ago or so. So that can be related to a t derivative acting only on the subgraph semantic expressions. And that is what we have here. So actually, this is completely equal. Let me immediately write it to 1 over 2 epsilon times Tg to the power 2 epsilon. And then all of this gets replaced by Tg to the power omega h times the insertion uh from the lemma of uh, the t derivative of what we have here. And this is nothing but the polynomial p epsilon h 
with its arguments times the reduced graph expressions d tilde g over h to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i w g over h um, evaluated at t equals 0, but that is already done here, so we don't need to write it down anymore. So this was our uh, proposition d, which was based on our lemma from the uh, section from last week. And uh, right, so to see it once more explicitly, this is the relationship that we have here. So our p epsilon is an abbreviation for precisely this. And this is what we have in the lemma or the proposition. An arbitrary derivative with respect to t's and an arbitrary derivative operator with respect to u tildes. Here we have the same derivative and the same uh, derivative with respect to u's and t's. Here with the full semantic expression, here we have the reduced and the subgraph one. So it exactly matches to our um, proposition. And uh, again, um, one hour ago we saw that this proposition, uh, if we look at all the t factors, then we get here a factor tg to the power omega h in the front of this insertion because of the additional t dependencies that we have here. So let me just say this is as above. And uh, this can be combined to what we called uh tilde from before. So the uh tilde is what we obtain from uh by rescaling all its arguments uniformly by tg. And if you remember, this led to this new re-rescaled variables where the subgraph momenta and masses are rescaled only by tg instead of by th, which corresponds to the fact that we have integrated over th, so there is no th anymore at this point of the result. But anyway, this is what we can obtain by uh, looking at the first line and evaluating just the divergent part of the t-integration. So here is the divergence. This is whatever it is. It uh, still depends on epsilon. And uh, however, it contains also one over epsilon pole. Right, and now um, we know our curly bracket consists of three terms, namely this term and the non-divergent part of the t-integration and the second line. And of course, this and the second line can be combined, and then we have also the non-divergent part of the t-integration, which goes on its own. But let us first combine it. So in the combination, In the combination of this plus the second line in the curly bracket, let's say these are all the th divergent parts in the curly brackets, what do we have? We have, of course, a very nice correspondence. So the structure is that we always have this uh of p. We have it here at the bottom, and we also have it here. But it's not exactly the same, so the two terms do not add up to zero. And so there are actually two differences. So between this, what we have obtained from the two-loop graph, and the counterterm graph, there are two differences. And what are they? The first difference is the extra factor of Tg to the power 2 epsilon. This extra t3 to the power 2 epsilon appears because of the outer loop, the second loop. Um, okay, or maybe t additional extra in the first line, and that comes from two loop versus one loop. So the outer, uh, so the two loop graph is a genuine two loop graph which gets this additional factor. Uh, the other graph is formally of two-loop order, but it's actually a one-loop graph where we have some insertion. And uh, this behaves differently with respect to the Tg powers. So therefore, there is a mismatch in the Tg powers uh, for this reason. So this is one difference. And the other difference is this here, epsilon. 
Here we just obtain uh, whatever we obtain from the two-loop integration, and we obtain here a pole, but we also obtain a non-trivial epsilon dependence, and that is just what uh, we have in the result. So this epsilon dependence is there. However, here by definition, we had to set epsilon to zero. So this T of H contains um, one over two epsilon times the polynomial at epsilon equals zero. So that is also a mismatch. So we have pH of epsilon in the two loop graph versus pH of zero in the counter terms. And uh, that is essentially from the inner loop. And while the other could be attributed to the outer loop, And this is from the inner loop. And uh, the fact that we have here to put zero, I have to put here zero, comes from our MS prescription, the minimal subtraction prescription. This is not absolutely necessary. We could also add higher orders in epsilon, but we choose to uh, take only the lowest order in epsilon. And uh, in other words, define the counter terms as pure one over epsilon poles. This is a systematic prescription, which we can follow. We could also change it, uh, as I said in the beginning, we can change the renormalization scheme by adding finite counter terms. We can do that at any stage, but for the moment we fix the scheme to be the minimal subtraction scheme. And then we have here a mismatch. And I mean, even if we would have another scheme, then there is absolutely no guarantee that uh, such things could always cancel. But uh, I mean, in this case, one might say, okay, we changed the scheme by just putting here epsilon. Then we have no mismatch at this point, but um, I mean, then we might have some mismatch somewhere else later on. But uh, this is what we fix now. Okay, so two differences, and uh, then let us look at the structure of uh, how it um, comes together. We have then overall in our curly bracket the following objects we have, u tilde h, and uh, the different factors can be all brought into the u tilde h, because uh, the second line in the curly bracket is already u tilde h times this, and now also the first line is put into the form that remaining factor times u of something. So let's put everything inside of the u tilde h. Then we have u tilde h of the following mismatch. For, for the first line or for the two loop graph, we have an additional 2 tg to the power 2 epsilon times the polynomial ph at arbitrary epsilon. And for the subgraph, uh, renormalization, we just have no TG and we have only the polynomial evaluated at zero. So that is really the key thing that we have. And this then is, acts onto the rest. But this is really the interesting quantity. And uh, here we have now isolated the cancellation of subdivergencies. This is really the most minimal expression where we see the cancellation of subdivergencies. This is the subdivergence. This is how it gets multiplied in the counter term graph. This is how it gets multiplied in the full graph. And you see already that the divergence cancels because the difference uh, is of the order epsilon since at epsilon equals zero, it vanishes. Therefore, we see the divergence is cancel. And now we just want to manipulate it a little bit further and bring it into a form which can be generalized to make it a little bit more abstract, take a step back, make it more abstract uh, to see the general features of this, which can be found again in the more general cases. So the trick, very trivial trick, however a trick that we can now apply and that can also be done in general is to do the following. This square bracket can be rewritten as follows, Tg to the power 2 epsilon, because there are two cancellations happening because of the P and because of the Tg. And so let's uh, split them. 
So we do it like this. T3 to the power 2 epsilon minus 1, first of all. So this would be just the epsilon dependence of that. Isolated, multiplied with the polynomial at 0. Then plus T3 to the power 2 epsilon times the difference polynomial at epsilon minus polynomial at 0. So we add a 0 and uh, subtract, uh, so we add and subtract the same thing. So here, if, uh, what cancels, so we have here t3 to the power 2 epsilon times the polynomial at epsilon. That is what we also have over there with a plus. Here we have minus the polynomial at 0, like over there, and then we have something in the middle, t3 to the 2 epsilon times polynomial at 0 minus T3 to the 2 epsilon minus polynomial at 0. So this cancels. So this is the same. But now we have isolated the T3 dependence and the polynomial dependence of the result. And we can also multiply it with 1 over 2 epsilon. And then we write it this divided by 2 epsilon and that divided by 2 epsilon. And then everything is manifestly finite because that is, of course, analytic in epsilon. If you take epsilon to zero, uh, the one over two epsilon cancels, and what remains is really a holomorphic function of epsilon, or analytic. Here are the same. Uh, these are analytic functions in epsilon. Um, if we divide by epsilon, we essentially take the derivative, so since it's uh, analytic or holomorphic in epsilon, this combination uh, also is. And uh, However, uh, so this is analytic in epsilon, which is nice, um, but why did we, uh, that was also analytic in epsilon, uh, by the way, but why did we split it in this way? Because we have now extracted the TG dependence. Why should we extract the TG dependence? We should do it because overall, in the end, we want to integrate once again over TG for the outer loop integration. That is why we need to know how our, um, Result here depends on Tg. And this dependence is not analytic or not C infinity. Previously, all, we always had a C infinity behavior in Tg, which most of the time is also analytic or holomorphic. But here, anyway, we have a singularity. Because if we take some derivatives with respect to Tg of T3 to the power 2 epsilon for any finite epsilon, we will eventually get negative uh, powers of Tg, like 1 over Tg. And at Tg equals 0, that is singular. So even uh, to some fractional power, Tg to some fractional power, at Tg equals 0, this is a singular expression. It is not uh, differentiable, not holomorphic, and not analytic. Therefore, this is not a C infinity expression in terms of Tg, but it is analytic in epsilon. Um, and this, by the way, is also not uh, C infinity in Tg at Tg equals 0. Uh, I mean, it's a fractional, like a square root or a generalized square root. It's a fractional power. Therefore, it's not uh, analytic at Tg equals 0. Very good. Therefore, we have managed to have the following structure. Functions of Tg and epsilon, which are analytic in epsilon but not analytic in Tg times other functions which are either constant here or analytic in epsilon and uh, not dependent on Tg but anyway would be uh, analytic in Tg because it doesn't depend on Tg. So we have split it into these two kinds of functions and that is important. So that is the general feature so it corresponds to the following sum of two terms, and each term has the following structure, namely a function singular in Tg, but analytic in epsilon. And it's a quite simple function, quite elementary function, times another function which is uh, here independent of Tg and also analytic in epsilon. This is what we have achieved.
Right, so we have almost managed to do our first loop calculation. So the first loop integration is the one over the subgraph H. We have done it for the counter term and we have partially done it for the full graph because we have extracted the divergent part. So we have uh, done the divergent part of the TH integral. It combines with the counter term to give something finite and the finite remainder is of this form. Some of terms like singular function in TG and a function independent of TG. Question. What about the remainder? What is actually the remainder? So we still need to do the TH non-divergent part of the integral in the first line of our curly bracket. So what is this TH regular part? And once we have done that, we have really everything. So this is Tg to the power 2 epsilon times the loop factor Cd times 2. And then the Th integration, dTh, Th to the power minus omega h minus 1 plus 2 epsilon. Um, and then what? So then we had originally our function g, which was infinitely differentiable in all its variables. And now the definition of this t integration was the divergent part is given by this, and the finite part is given by the Taylor expansion, or we sub subtract off from this its Taylor polynomial up to the order we uh, use here. So we subtract from this, uh, uh, and I write it in this notation, 1 minus curly t, Taylor operator, of the following order, omega h, in the variable, uh, which variable, th. That acts on this, and this subtracts away this Taylor polynomial, and therefore afterwards, this thing here behaves like th to the power omega plus 1 and therefore uh, it makes this finite here. And actually this was not all, but it was all that needed to be integrated, so this needs to be integrated, and uh, this is now a manifestly finite integral over th. But uh, if we extract a divergence like this, there were some extra terms, and I just uh, don't want to be very explicit, you can look it up, there were some extra terms coming from uh, the other poles, because there are poles at epsilon minus 1, epsilon minus 2, epsilon minus 3. Uh, but these poles are irrelevant for us, since we take the limit epsilon going to 0 in the end. For us, these are analytic expressions in epsilon. So uh, let me just say there are terms which we called G uh, superscript K, so the case derivative of G evaluated at 0 divided by k factorial. So let's just say these terms. They are not integrated because uh, here th has been put to zero, so they are outside of the integral, and they are manifestly finite, and uh, the dependence on epsilon is, as I said, like 1 over epsilon minus 1, or 1 over epsilon minus 2. So for a small epsilon, this is analytic in epsilon. And um, therefore, this is a finite integral over a function which was C infinity in all its variables. So after we evaluate this finite integral, uh, uh, it still is an infinitely differentiable and continuous function of all the remaining variables, not of th anymore, but of all the rest. And this uh, is as well. So therefore, the only non-analytic behavior is this here again, and we can write it in the same spirit as before, as this non-analytic function, th to the power 2 epsilon. It's, not, uh, it's uh, analytic in epsilon, but not in tg, times some c infinity functions. Um, in the following variables. What are the variables that the result can depend on? It cannot depend on th, 
Previously, it depended uh, on the tilde variables, and the tilde variables were, for example, QH times um, TH times TG. Okay, that was our variable, or also TH times TG times MH. That was our variable. Now we integrate over H. That means afterwards it can only depend on this combination and that combination. And this is what we called Q double tilde. The re-rescaled variables. So it automatically depends on this combination. And anyway, it depends on uh, everything else like Q tilde G. That was not dependent on TH. Therefore, that dependence remains also m tilde g. Can it depend on anything else? Yes, it can depend on tg as well. So this, um, actually, uh, yeah, it can depend on tg, also in a c-infinity way. And um, anything else? Betas, of course. It depends on beta 3 and 4 in a c-infinity way. Anything else? Um, no, that's it. And of course, it depends on epsilon, and it is analytic in epsilon. So we have such a product, Tg to this power times such a function, or such a sum of functions with these variables. OK, and now you see that automatically, everywhere in this uh, one-loop calculation with the integral over Th, the result is a combination of functions like this, singular in T, analytic in epsilon, and uh, independent of Tg, analytic in epsilon. Uh, actually, here it can be dependent on, on Tg, but uh, that was not important. Anyway, it's the infinity in Tg. Now, but what is interesting is the variables have changed. So this C infinity function is a function of the new re-rescaled variables, which are appropriate for the graph after treating uh, the subgraph H. So these are variables which are appropriate for our reduced graph G over H in the appropriate sector. Very good. So we have achieved a very nice result and let me write it next to this one here. Here this was our starting point. 1 minus T sub H acting on G. We have now evaluated it and uh, the result, let's copy it from here, has the same outer loop integration CD times 2 times DTG TG to the power minus omega G minus 1 plus 2 epsilon, 2 epsilon remains because that is common to all the uh, diagrams. Then what also remains is the beta 3 and 4 integration, z tilde g. And then we have times sums or sum of terms like, let's say, fi times gi. And what do I mean by this? So the fi's, they are functions of only tg and epsilon. And in our examples, there appeared tg to the power 2 epsilon or tg to the 2 epsilon minus 1 divided by 2 epsilon. Uh, either way, these are analytic in epsilon but singular in Tg. And on the other hand, there appears functions Gi, which are C infinity in all variables. And the variables are the ones which are appropriate for the reduced graph G over H. So that meant that we had to re-rescale the subgraph variables for H. So in from the subgraph, there are still some variables in the game because, of course, the external momenta of the subgraph uh, play a role in the final result. 
but they are rescaled in this way. Likewise, the masses of the subgraphs are, of course, important for the final result, but they are rescaled in this way. And then all the external momenta and the masses of the full graph anyway appear, of course, and uh, the TG and the outer betas also appear. So these are the variables. And by the way, uh, also the U. The U also appears. U tilde of G. Only U tilde of G appears because U tilde of H has been dealt with. So these are the variables appropriate for this reduced graph. Um, and uh, uh, the appropriate rescaling for the reduced graph of C infinity in all these variables. And analytic in epsilon. So what we have managed to achieve is that actually we did not really calculate the result and uh, that is okay because anyway we have calculated it already before in different ways. But what we have now done is we have found the general principle which might always happen because uh, this is a structure which looks like it could always be true. Because always in the cancellation of the subdivergencies, something like this will appear, right? This lemma or proposition D will always be applicable. That is quite obvious. And uh, then we will might always get such a mismatch between the T factors because it was always true that the outer uh, or the full diagram has more loops than all the counter term diagrams and therefore we get here a mismatch. Maybe the mismatch has uh, more powers of TG than just two epsilon because at the multi-loop level uh, the, count, the full diagram might have many more loops than the counter term diagrams. And uh, also here maybe uh, the difference is more subtle or more complicated than just one polynomial evaluated at zero or at epsilon. Uh, that could be more complicated but uh, Something like this will happen because uh, the counter term will always have such a polynomial with fixed epsilon because the counter term is calculated once and for all in a certain way and for us in the minimal subtraction scheme and for the full graph whatever appears from the integration appears and then we have to deal with it. So there will always be these two mismatches and uh, they can be manipulated into such an expression then the regular part of the uh, subloop integral um, doesn't have to be evaluated to just study the divergencies, but it uh, is not entirely analytic, but it gives rise to this structure where we have such a factor times a C infinity function, and uh, therefore it is also part of, uh, of this structure. Yeah. And um, so as you see from uh, the explicit example, if we split it in this way into products of functions, products of such elementary functions and the infinity functions, then uh, different sets of these um, elementary functions appear, elementary but singular. And uh, so this appears twice. It appears both for the regular part and also for the divergent part, and this only appears in the divergent part. But anyway, we um, at the multi-loop level can imagine that we will get more complicated such functions, but uh, something like this will happen in general. With these words, we can now complete the uh, lecture by doing the second step, and this is now very easy because we have found this structure, and so uh, that means we have already abstracted away from the concrete uh, result, so we only need to deal with this expression from which we know not the exact, um, let's say, uh, the exact analytic form, but we know the behavior, and that should be sufficient. And so we just go on on this uh, more superficial level. Let me clean the blackboard, and then we finish the lecture. So this is our result for treating the first subgraph, treating in the sense that we have uh, used before. So we evaluated the first loop integral, cancelled the subdivergence explicitly. We got a finite remainder and also a finite expression from the regular part of the integral. And all of this can be expressed in this form. And now we can progress to the two-loop level.
So we evaluate now the final object, namely 1 minus Tg times 1 minus Th applied onto G. And we will evaluate the Tg integral. So we first note that in each term of the previous line, So we have uh, this uh, beta 3 and 4 integral and the c tilde g. This contains derivatives with respect to u, uh, g variables, and um, this is c infinity in u tilde g. Therefore, if we take these derivatives, it is still c infinity. If we uh, set u g to 0 afterwards, it is still c infinity in all the remaining variables. If we integrate over beta in a compact integration region, it is still uh, C infinity in all the remaining variables. That means we can trivially, essentially, from the point of view of structure, evaluate those uh, operations, beta 3 and 4, and uh, Z tilde G acts uh, or gives something which is um, okay on G. Um, the result is on GI. The result is still C infinity in all relevant or remaining variables. And of course, also analytic in epsilon, because that is not changed at all by, by these operations. That means we can uh, directly write down and assume we have done these operations. Afterwards, there is no beta 3 and 4 and no u tilde g anymore. So this is set to 0. So we have some new uh, sum of terms. Uh, so by the way, I didn't stress it before, but uh, so this uh, is written as if this acts onto also the f's. But uh, this operation has nothing to do with the f's. They can be factored out of the integration and uh, the differentiation. So in, in the end, this acts only on the g functions, which are uh, the c infinity functions. And therefore, this is true. And what, uh, the f's just are factored out. And what remains is still a sum of terms like fi times integrals over the g's. So let's write this in the following way. We get sum of terms like the following. So to be complete, loop factor times 2 times a th integral, a tg integral, sorry, tg to the power minus omega g minus 1 plus 2 epsilon. And then the functions fi of tg and epsilon and then times whatever remained from this operation. Uh, let's give it some names. Let me call it gi prime. This is the resulting uh, object. And this gi prime is a function, uh, let me be explicit here, of the re rescaled variables, g double tilde of h, um, which was given by tg times QH, and so on. So let me not write everything, but uh, there is also G tilde, G, M double tilde, H, M tilde, G, and um, what else? Epsilon. Um, but Now, uh, forgive me, there is, uh, I need some uh, moment to think. Is there a TG dependence or not? Actually, um, 
I uh, said at some point before there is no, I, I think I wasn't consistent whether there is a TG dependence or not, but anyway, of course, uh, in the E to the IW, this depends on TG. But let's go on. Uh, maybe I have to come back to this later, but I am not uh, exactly sure right now. Uh, anyway, all the integrals uh, have the following structure. They are the TG integrals. And uh, TG now appears uh, maybe in two places, but for sure it appears in the Fs in a non-analytic way, namely in this way, in these different ways. And uh, it appears here also in a non-analytic way, and then it depends here in a C infinity way or not at all. Uh, and from these Fs here, the T only appears in an exponentiated form. So this means it appears in, uh, in the TG to some epsilon powers that can be combined with these epsilon powers here. So all the TG integrals have the form TG to some, uh, let's say, general uh, minus omega G minus 1, and then plus n times 2 epsilon. And here in this case, uh, we only have 2 epsilon or 4 epsilon, but in general, it's n times 2 epsilon times uh, some g, um, which is a C infinity function of Tg. And uh, so Tg appears again in, uh, indirectly via these three scaled variables everywhere. And maybe it also appears explicitly. Ah, uh, okay, actually now I take it back. Uh, sorry, I was confused for a moment here. So there is no explicit T3 dependence. Uh, maybe you knew it before, but let me now uh, use my confusion to make it crystal clear. Uh, all the T3 dependence is going via uh, these three scaled variables. And we saw it very much in the beginning when we had this curly M. The curly M was rescaled into a curly M tilde using the T matrices and uh, then doing it like this, acting on Qs. Uh, that made clear that Tg cannot appear in the M tilde. The M tilde can only contain smaller Ts. It cannot contain the um, the uh, TG for the full graph because of the homogeneity of everything. Um, and, um, and, uh, and here the TG is absorbed in the rescaled variables. Therefore, there is no TG dependence in our W. And anyway, we knew it even earlier in the semantic polynomial D tilde, there is no TG either. Therefore, there is no TG dependence explicit anywhere. The only TG dependence is via the rescaled variables for masses and momenta or use, as long as the use exists. Here, the use do not exist anymore, uh, but the masses and momenta still exist. They are rescaled by T, and then this is the precise only a TG dependence. No other TG dependence exists. But here in the integration, of course, we, uh, the physical momenta are fixed, and this is a variable. So during the integration, this is actually not a constant, right? It's an abbreviation, and the integrand depends on these abbreviations. But uh, for the integration, this is a constant, and this is an integration variable. This is important. And so we know that we have the C infinity behavior in these abbreviated variables. That is physical, that is an integration variable, and so this is, of course, indirectly also C infinity in the integration variable Tg, but the dependence is very specific, and it doesn't appear explicit. So this doesn't exist. It never exists uh, for the full graph. Okay, sorry for the confusion. 
But anyway, uh, now in this shorthand notation, uh, we have this indirect dependence on Tg, and then this is the structure of our integrals. Now, uh, so the divergent part can be obtained as usual. What are the cases that we encounter in our concrete example? We encounter two cases because we have found two such f functions, uh, this one and uh, the more complicated one. So the first one um, would be this. The actual thing that appears in the integral is then, uh, let's look here at the object. So Tg to this power times f. So the first f that appears is Tg itself. So we get Tg times f1. And uh, this is just Tg to the power 4 epsilon. So this is, of course, uh, simple. So if we now take the T a divergent part of uh, something which contains this f1. So let's put here f1. Then the divergent part is given by 1 over 4 epsilon, because we have 4 epsilon here, 1 over 4 epsilon times the t derivative of that. d by d t g to the power omega g of our g1 prime as we called it here explicitly, which is a function not of Tg explicitly, but only of the abbreviations um, which I write down um, absolutely completely. And after taking the derivative, we have to set Tg to zero. This is what we obtain here. Now, so this means that from this F1 part, um, we get a single 1 over epsilon pole times such a derivative of this function g1 prime, about which we know not everything, but we know it's a C-infinity function of precisely those variables and epsilon. What does this remind you of? Hopefully it reminds you of something. It reminds you of the case when we had this polynomial for the first time in our subgraph. And there I explained to you in generality that if you have such a t derivative of a function which depends only indirectly on t via these abbreviations, then uh, you can use the chain rule and this acts like derivatives with respect to the tilde variables times the inner derivative. And the inner derivative gives you just prefactors of q and m. That means omega g such derivatives give you a polynomial prefactor in q's and m's, a polynomial of degree omega g times the remaining uh, derivative. And then you put tg to zero, which annihilates all the arguments. That means you get a polynomial times a constant, which doesn't depend on these physics variables anymore. So this expression here is a polynomial. It's a polynomial in uh, the physics variables not in the abbreviations, but in the actual physics variables q sub h without tilde q sub g, q m sub h, m sub g, and in epsilon, uh, and a function of epsilon. It's a polynomial of degree omega g. That is what we want. We have now managed to uh, figure out and to prove, this is a proof that, uh, that 1 over epsilon divergence of our two-loop integration which results from the F1 term is a polynomial in the physics variables of degree omega g with coefficients which are analytic in epsilon times 1 over epsilon. So the divergence is local. Uh, I will write it down uh, in a second. But what happens here in this case, in the case F2, in the case F2 we have Tg to the 2 epsilon times f2, and uh, this is more complicated. We have here tg to the 4 epsilon minus tg to the 2 epsilon divided by 2 epsilon. Okay, so 
So this is the prefactor that we have. So we need to integrate this times uh, t to the omega to the g minus one, uh, omega g minus one times the g function. So if we evaluate the tg divergent part, you can do it also explicitly at home uh, using a few uh, lines of calculation. Um, but I do it everything at once. Um, so plugging in this result into here, then uh, from we get two t integrations. And from this one, we obtain 1 over 4 epsilon times this 1 over 2 epsilon. And from this t integration, we obtain uh, 1 over 2 epsilon times the other 1 over 2 epsilon. So this is the prefactor we get 1 over 8 epsilon square minus 1 over 4 epsilon square from uh, the usual prefactor. Instead of this, we have that. And the rest is the same, d by dt g to the omega g of now g2 prime, because that was our name, g2 prime of the same variables. At tg equals 0. OK. So for the same reason as before, this is now a polynomial. As before, that was the case of the subgraph H calculated in isolation. There we encountered for the first time this polynomial and the same argument. Um, these expressions are polynomials. in the physics variables qh, qg, without tilde, mh, and mg of degree omega g, which is the power counting degree of our full graph g. And uh, the divert this is the only place where a 1 over epsilon divergence can appear in our full loop integration. And the coefficients of this polynomial are, first of all, 1 over uh, 4 epsilon times an analytic function in epsilon. In the first case, because this is analytic in epsilon, and uh, the 1 over 4 epsilon is an explicit, or uh, and uh, this combination is simply uh, whatever it is, doesn't really matter, but it's minus 1 over 4 epsilon square, also times an analytic function in epsilon. Right. And the important thing uh, is that we simply have, in the end, um, 1 over epsilon square times a polynomial, uh, p2 maybe, or yeah, p, let's say pg of epsilon uh, 2 plus 1 over epsilon times pg comma 1 of epsilon. And these are polynomials of the desired degree in our physics variables. And uh, this is the only uh, 1 over epsilon divergence of the TG integration. Well, and then we can essentially stop because what we wanted to show is the finiteness of the full renormalized expression. And what we have now achieved is not, uh, we have not calculated the full result, but we have achieved to see that once we apply this, uh, we obtained the intermediate expression, which is here. This is the intermediate expression, which still contains the TG integral. And what we have done here is we have evaluated the TG integral to the point where we know what the result has, a, uh, what kind of res uh, result um, we obtain. And the result we obtain is the TG integral has a divergent part, and the divergent part comes from integrating 
And we have really integrated now uh, the T3 loop, at least the divergent part of it. Uh, it gives something complicated from the complicated behavior of the Fs combined with the additional T3 to the 2 epsilon factor. So this is, let me highlight it, what we have done here to here. That is our two-loop calculation. This is the two-loop calculation which we did from here to there. So this is uh, the actual integrand in the uh, form where we isolated the singularities in T from the C infinity parts and then the result can be written like this. 1 over epsilon poles and 1 over epsilon square poles and each coefficient even of the 1 over epsilon pole is just the polynomial of the desired degree in all the physics variables. Okay, and so I will just end with a small text. What we see from this the T3 integration generates these divergent terms and they have the desired local structure. Let's call it local. This is simpler to say. They have the desired local structure, which means they are polynomials of the desired degree in the physics variables, so that these divergences can be put as counter terms into the Lagrangian. Uh, technically, using our notation, it means that this object, T, the divergent part of 1 minus T sub H acting on G, just the divergent part of this, which is what we have now extracted, which is also the same as T of R bar of G in our sector. So I should always write subscript sector, but uh, I left it out. This is local and defines the two loop counter term in a viable way. And therefore, the divergence can be written as a counter term, which is important. And the second thing, this is then, however, more or less obvious, so that 1 minus t acting on 1 minus th on g, uh, this is the same as tg because it's anyway acting on the full graph, is now finite. So the finiteness is obvious because uh, this is defined as subtracting the divergence, but the point is the divergence is local, so it can actually be subtracted using a counter term. So this is finite, but we also know the analytical structure of the result. So we didn't explicitly mention it, but uh, so this is a polynomial in the physics uh, variables, and it still also uh, contains analytic uh, parts in epsilon. There is also a higher order in epsilon, which uh, we might not subtract using the counter terms. And uh, the remainder, the finite part of the T integration, comes again from subtracting this Taylor polynomial from the G functions. If we do that, then uh, we can integrate, and the uh, result of the integral is, of course, C infinity in all the variables because it was C infinity from the beginning and it's a completely finite integration. Therefore, this is finite and analytic in epsilon, still depends on epsilon, and C infinity in all uh, physics variables, which are QH, QG, M, H, and M, G. And there are no T's and beta's anymore, so all the loop integrations have been completely done. This ends our example, and uh, the take-home message from the example is um, that uh, these interesting functions F appear 
they appear by uh, separating um, here in the sub-integration. Uh, uh, there are these two mismatches. Here the, uh, the TG has a different coefficient and uh, the polynomial here had epsilon equal zero versus epsilon equal non-zero. So in the difference, uh, we saw the cancellation of divergences, but uh, the cancellation uh, was made um, nicer uh, by individually canceling the t's and the um, polynomial part. And then we obtained such, let's say, elementary functions which contain the singularity in Tg or isolate the singularity in Tg, but which are nevertheless analytic in epsilon. The remainder is C infinity in epsilon, and then we can do the next integration and extract the divergence of the next integration by the familiar method of derivatives with respect to Tg at Tg equals zero. This is important. So what we need to do in general is to generalize such a set of elementary functions. So at the multi-loop level, they will become more and more complicated, but the structure is always kind of uh, reminiscent of this structure. And uh, at the multi-loop level, it will remain to be the case that the remainder is then C infinity in all the remaining variables. And what you have also seen as a second take home message is the re-rescaling of the variables. Initially, we have the full T, um, full set of T's for the full graph. After we deal with the subgraph H, there is no TH anymore, no TH variable anymore, and therefore we have to re-rescale our subgraph variables. Here I call them uh, G or Q double tilde or M double tilde. And they are just rescaled by Tg alone, but not by Th for the subgraph, and so on. And if we do it at the multi-loop level, then we have to do such a rescaling each time we treat a subgraph, and uh, the T variable for the subgraph gets integrated out. So this is what we have learned, and so we will the next time uh, complete the general proof, but it mimics essentially this procedure but it will involve an induction, of course, over the number of loops. And uh, so for each loop, uh, we uh, get more and more complicated integrals. And each time, uh, we need to bring it to such a form. And we will manage to do that. It's actually not too difficult uh, after all the preparation we have done so far.